this business and business may be a loose term for it is called the snake river base academy and Mm -hmm. our purpose is to advance the general knowledge and skill level of fixed object parachuting worldwide so fixed object parachuting is commonly referred to as base jumping Mm -hmm. base jumping uh is parachuting from a fixed object like a building or a bridge or a cliff Mm -hmm. rather than from an aircraft uh, some kind of vehicle so in general uh Fixed object parachuting base jumping has long been viewed as a sort of redheaded stepchild of the skydiving world. Skydivers don't want to admit that they're related to base jumping and that's Why? not skydiving. Why uh, is there's that? a lot of politics around it. Okay. Uh, and, and mostly what it has to do with is laws, mm. right? So here's the thing. In many places, for example, national parks in the United States, it is illegal to parachute from mm-hmm. cliffs mm-hmm. in national parks in the United States. And skydivers are very concerned about the politics of things like airport access. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, if I want to open a new drop zone, a skydiving operation somewhere, I have to go to local county authorities, the FAA, get all these permissions in order to run this parachute operation there. And the more that I look like an above board, solid citizen, the easier that's going to be, right? Uh, historically, base jumpers have been a bunch of mangy guys with mohawks and lots of tattoos uh, who are hiding in the woods and running from the law. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah. if you want to look like an upstanding businessman and convince people to let you run your parachuting operation at their little airport, mm-hmm. you don't want to be associated with those guys mm-hmm. because they look like criminals and hoodlums, mm-hmm. right? Uh, as a result, historically in the United States, the general parachuting association, which is called the USPA, the United States Parachute Association, historically has sort of disavowed and tried very hard to distance itself from base jumping, from fixed object parachuting. Mm. Uh, There was an infamous moment, at least if you're a base jumper, in which a guy named Bill Otley, who was the head of the United States Parachute Association, described to the press base jumping, and he said to them that it had nothing to do with skydiving. In fact, what he said was, it's not at all akin to skydiving, it is more akin to a circus act. Uh, because he was trying to create a distance mm. in people's minds between these two activities. Uh, where was I going with that? So the, <laughs> the truth is that, that base jumping for a long time has been non-institutionalized, practiced in the shadows, right? It's, it's a, something that, that happens in the dark at home, not at the drop zone. There's not a lot of cross-communication between different base jumpers. Mm. Um, and as a result, when I started base jumping, there was a lot of knowledge lost. What we saw was... People would get into base jumping and they would do a bunch of jumping and they would learn a lot. And a lot of it was experimental and people were getting hurt with these wild experiments because, they, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Mm. Uh, in many ways, we still don't know what we're doing. And these people would gain a much higher and higher knowledge level and then they would go away. Uh, in, in some cases, they would die. Uh, mm-hmm. But in a lot of cases, they would just move on with their lives. They would get married. They would have kids. Mm-hmm. They would start a career. They would do things that were not compatible with sneaking around on the roof of a building at 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And they would stop doing it. And this knowledge and experience they had gained would just be lost. Yeah. And then somebody else would start base jumping in that same city two years later, and they would have to start from ground zero and learn mm. everything again. Mm. And so we saw this surge and loss and surge and loss. And there was a little bit of carryover between those generations, but there were so many people trying to reinvent the wheel. It was crazy. Everybody who started base jumping was pretty much inventing it for themselves. Uh, and I had seen a lot of knowledge loss, and I had had a lot of friends who gained a lot of knowledge and died. Uh, and... I wanted to achieve a couple of things. Uh, One of them was to professionalize base instruction more. Um, One of them was to hold knowledge, find a place where we could hold knowledge and pass it on to people so it wasn't continually lost and having to be rediscovered with each generation. Uh, One of the things, honestly, I was trying to do was honor the memory of all my friends who had died gaining that knowledge. Mm. Um, And another big goal of mine was to create ongoing training because at the time, base training uh, was in a very sad state. I mean, mostly it was learned by doing experimental. And there were some people who were offering instruction, and I perhaps use the term loosely, where they would, you know, take your thousand bucks and take you out and chuck you off an antenna in the middle of the night a couple of times and tap you on the head and say, presto, now you're a base jumper. Mm. And that was this, the state of base training. That was, that was as good as it got. Um, and I was hoping to create ongoing training where more than just we got you through your first jump without dying, mm. we talked about other safety skills. These are things you need to know or you should know in order to continue jumping in the safest possible manner 
that you wish. Right. Uh, and so one of the things I was trying to do is create continuing education in base jumping. Uh, and in that sense, the school has been a radical success. Uh, mm-hmm. When I first launched secondary training courses, not just an introductory course, I cannot tell you the number of people who told me I was insane and no one would ever pay for that. And why would you do that? And we're just all out here doing our thing. And that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now pretty much everyone else who is in any way involved in the base training industry and industry is probably not the right word for it, uh, is offering something akin to that. I've seen at least three programs that are modeled on our program, right? You start out with a fundamentals course, then you do object avoidance work, then you do evaluation work, then you do tracking work. Uh, this, so, so that, that idea has certainly caught on, and right. that's one of the major victories we've had here. Are you the first to really introduce to, you know, a, instead of just the introductory? Yes, introductory, we, you're the first we, to do that. We were the first place on earth that anyone offered a non-introductory based training course. That's crazy. Uh, and for several years, people thought that was insane. And in fact, I had an experience uh, in which some of my students were told by people who were offering introductory base experiences that that was crazy, and they were going to get killed if they tried to do that kind of thing. Uh, and the person who told my students that is now offering those kinds of courses. Uh, <laughs> some of that is just m- the market, right? Yeah. I mean, if you do something and it's successful and people want it, then somebody else is going to want to do it too. Right. Uh, and some of it's very gratifying in that we've had this effect. We're really advancing the idea of base training worldwide. Right. 